I'm Leo Laporte. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for sharing. Coming up in today's show, Crusoe is here, and David Ditzel, the CEO of Transmeta, will show us a brand new chip with a brand new idea and some very cool things you could do with it. This is the project that, remember when Linus Torvalds was here about yes. a year ago, and we, we said, well, what do you, what, what brings you to the state, the inventor of Linux? And he said, I can't tell you, or I'd have to kill you. Yeah, we can't talk about that, but we can talk about something new. Is that how he said that? No. <laughs> so we found out what Linus has been up to. He's been doing some really neat stuff, and we're going to show you the result of his years of work. All right. A few other people's. Coming up. Coming up. Also, we're going to show you a way to, in theory, we're going to show you a way to archive your important documents for an easy offline storage solution, which is really, really cool if and when it works. Really. That's exactly what I expected when they said, you're going to do a computer show on TV. I said, oh, yeah, we'll be covering things like document archiving for offline storage solutions, won't we? And people will go, yes. Ooh. Then later, <laughs> set-top boxes from the Consumer Electronics Show that converge television and computers. Wow. It's a perfect match, like soup and sandwich on today's Fresh Gear. All right. Before we introduce today's topic in the chat room. Poll. Poll. Poll, poll from yesterday. Final result. Question was, would you believe a virtual news anchor? This is from Ananova.com. 54% of you say yes. Pretty even split. 46% of you say no. But, you know, she's really just going to be translating text to speech anyway, so it's not a big deal. Today, zap me. Zap me. Zap me. Oh, this makes us so mad. You know what zap me is? Zap Me is a company that wants to put, it actually, it sounds like a great idea. They go to a school, they say, hey, we're going to get you $90,000 with the technology and yep. free Internet access. Wow. We're set you up. You're going, to be, you're, you're going to be able to have computers in the library, computers in the classroom. You're all going to be online. This is going to be the greatest thing. They are pure benevolent beings, right? Well, there's one little catch. Oh, shoot. We're going to have some ads oh. on the computer. That's all. And we have to make sure the kids can see them. Right. A lot of schools adopting it. Wall Street Journal tells us, according to a couple of consumer watchdog groups, including Ralph Nader, hello, and Phyllis Shafley, that apparently ZAPME has been collecting demographic information about the kids in the school without, without parental permission. Who's that? <laughs> I don't think so. We're arcing. It's scary. Marcus was zapping us. Ooh, I'm zapping. Zap me. Zap me. So All what right. do you think? Is, is that, I mean, to me, my uh, God, that is not only, I mean, first of all, it's bad enough that companies go around stealing your and my information about places we go on the web and what we buy and things like that. But to do it to innocent, defenseless kids. Oh, who are just trying to learn something, oh, too. Boy. They're not being consumer. Okay, the question is, folks, should education be for sale? Now, this is that get them while they're young. Make them consumers when they're really, really young. Taking that demographic information, you know what I say? No. Education should not be for sale. We should not have to be so desperate in our educational system to get basic educational tools for our children that we have to sell out to a corporation and make them part of marketing and demographic information. That is sick. You tell them, sister. It's sick. Yeah, baby. So there. I agree with you. All right. But we want to know what you think. Okay. Take the web poll at thescreensavers.com, and there's nowhere to click that says, that's sick, man, but you can <laughs> click on the talkback feature and just type, and just type it in. All right. Okay. You can also give us a call on the telephone, 888-989-7879. That's toll-free from North America. Mm -hmm. You could chat with us, chat.zdnet.com. Screensavers Room is where the uh, main action is. But you know where the, the other action is? Where is it? The action for people who want to be on television. Click on the net cam cineplex because Shannon, who's in there with Shannon? Brad. Brad and Shannon. What, what do, do you, you call, call college? college? <laughs> oh, sold-out education? Okay. Yeah, but and he's we... got a diploma for sale written on his sketch there. You can tell he made it through college this is a, as well. I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to submit that those two are in exactly what's wrong with the schools today. Oh, no, sorry. No, I'm thinking, <laughs> there, I'm thinking there, we're wrong. They're there, there, there. like, what? She's like, uh -oh. I'm not even looking Shannon's at you now. Shannon's going to kill me later. Yep, she's going to kick <laughs> you back. And, of course, earn yourself the fabulous coveted upside down <laughs> screensavers magnet yes as seen on our fridge soon to be seen on yours there you are with tony yeah. and, and susan, susan and they just sent us like the hugest bag of and your bunny ears over him ghirardelli chocolate everybody in the studio is hyped today because everybody's eating chocolate yeah you noticed that huh Land yeah. <laughs> Do you have to judge you? Do I have a ring around my mouth? Let me see, yeah. Land and Joyce. Is... Raspberry in your teeth, though. No. Land and Joyce is on the ZDTV 3Com Netcam Network from Meridian, Ohio. Hello, Landon. Idaho. 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 Right. Yeah, Nampa High used to play Meridian High all the time, and the year I was there, they beat us, like, almost every time. How you doing, Landon? 
Fine. Hi, Landon. What can we do for you, sir? Um, I want to know if there's a free program for... Um, for... Free. So programming basic programs um, and Java. Learning basic stuff. You want to learn Java and basic? Yeah. Well, let me make, give you some advice, okay? okay. Throw out basic. Don't learn okay. basic. It'll give you some bad habits. It's not worth learning. And nowadays, if you know Java, you're in great shape. And by the way, yes, there's free Java. All you have to do is go to the Sun uh, Java uh, Soft uh, website, javasoft.com. And you can learn, uh, not learn, but you can download their Java compiler. Okay. It's a, it's a command line compiler, but it's free, and you can start programming in Java. That would be cool. Now, I'm looking up HungryMinds.com. Oh, this is a great portal site for education. This but, is this is so you could find classes on Java. Yep. And there are, of course, tons of them out there. In fact, our own uh, uh, SmartPlanet.com has uh, Java classes. Well, I would, those I would, free, but... They're not free. But you wanted the, you said you wanted the class or you wanted the programming language? Um, programming language. Yeah. Oh, you want the language itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I see. Down, download Java for free from uh, Sunsoft, uh, Sun's Javasoft site, javasoft.com. Okay. I really think Java's a great thing to learn. Another thing, you know, I, you, dare I go back on my soapbox, another language I like a lot, Landon, I think I wish people would start with is uh, Python. Uh, you heard, have you heard me talk about that? No. Okay, python.org. Python.org. And one of the nice things about Python is there's a Java implementation of Python, so you can write Java code in Python as well, make Java classes out of it. Very it's called cool. JPython. The best thing, the reason I recommend Java, first of all, is there's some really, un unlike uh, uh, Java, where you're going to be use, working in a command line, so you use an editor and you'll run it through the Java compiler and then run it, and it takes a while and it's not intuitive. Python, has some, especially for Windows, a really nice user interface with a, with a, with a GUI and an editor and everything. Mm -hmm. The programs don't have to compile, they're interpreted, so you can run them instantaneously, which is good for new programmers because they can try something and immediately, and immediately get feedback it. on it. Yeah, exactly. And most importantly, the, the, the habit, unlike basic, where the habits you learn are habits you're going to have to break when you become a professional programmer, mm -hmm. when you learn the habits you learn in Python are really applicable to the future. It's object oriented, fully structured code. You're going to learn how to program for real, for right. And it's really a useful language, too. I write stuff in it all the time. This is the python.org site. So, two sites Java site, Java, I'm Java sorry, javasoft.com mm -hmm. and python.org, two places where you can get free languages uh, for almost any platform. And I do recommend, uh, say, uh, if you were going to learn, if you were to pick one language to learn and, and, and make a good living at it, I'd say Java. Java. Java would be absolutely it. All right. C, C++, Java are the three dominant languages out there right now. And the most flexible. How old are you, Lang Landon? Twelve. And you're, so you're in sixth grade? Seventh? Seventh. Seventh all grade. Right. Did they, don't, do they have programming in your school at all? No. No. You know, we were, and I'm not going to name names, but we went to a high school a while back. Oh, yeah. Visited. We, we actually went to a programming class that gave me the willies. It was the worst thing I've ever seen in my I'm life. Sorry, they were teaching them true. basic. They were teaching them bad stuff. It was, I'm sure, turning off most of the kids. You're probably better off, Landon, learning it yourself. One more tip, okay? If you're learning programming, get a buddy to learn it with. Oh, definitely. It's really useful if you have, get a mentor if you can, mm -hmm. but more importantly, get somebody else that you're learning it with, because then you can say, you know, I don't get, do you, if you, can you figure this? And you can work on it together and it makes a huge difference. That's how I learned to program. That's how most programmers learn. Okay, Landon? All right, I think we lost him there. Yeah. So you're going to be my buddy when I'm learning I'll be your programming right? buddy, okay. Okay. Thanks, um, Landon. Remember when I called in about the ultimate gaming machine? Uh, re refresh my memory. I called in um, to know the best um, gaming machine to for under a $1,000. Oh, you were the one. Yeah. Ah. We spent a lot of time on that one. Did you, did you end up getting one? Yeah, I got a compact Presario. Good choice. All right. And how does it play? I'm um, fine. 10 gig right. hard drive. All right. Hey, well, have fun. What games do you play? Um, Homeworld, Home um, Rogue great. Sphere, Age of Empires 2. So you like the structured things? Huh? You like the kind of the structured and things? Have yeah. you tried Asheron yet? No, I that's, haven't. That's the one Microsoft's design. It's basically Microsoft's uh, you know, answer to heroin. Yeah. Really? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Them, so. You go in and you start playing this game. It's an online world that you get involved in. And basically, you might as well kiss your life goodbye. And then you stop eating? And... Everything. Landon, oh, that's bad. my advice to you, don't play Asheron's Call. Learn how to program. You'll be much happier in the future, okay? All right. Okay. Thanks, Thank Landon. You. Take care, Landon. Bye-bye. Bye. After the break, virtual snap. Advice on how to preserve your privacy online in this week's news group recommendation. When the screensavers continues. Asheron? Asheron's call, yeah. Asheron's call. Yeah. Heroin? Basically, yeah. Uh,
music means it's time once again for News Groove. <laughs> this week's recommendation, Alt.Privacy, protect your privacy online and surf anonymously, how to mask your IP address, and since we've been talking about ZAPME and that reprehensible uh, plan to steal demographic information from children, and they talk about ZAPME quite a bit on Alt. Privacy. If you care about privacy online, I know Larry Ellison of Oracle said privacy is over. Get over it. But come on, these are babies we're we got talking to fight. about. No, we're not going to let them take our privacy. You'll uh -huh. find the link to this news group recommendation and all our news group recommendations. Our news grooves at thescreensavers.com. Uh, all right. We Moses. Moses. Moses is on the line from Grand Rapids. Hi, Grand Moses. Vision. Hi, Hi, Moses. Yeah. We're just waking up slowly. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I think Moses is, too. Good morning, Moses. Hello, Moses. How are you? We're well. Right. How are you? Okay, I've got a problem. I just uh, installed a cable modem. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's messed up my Microsoft Outlook. How has it messed it? What do you mean messed it up? Um, it keeps trying to go to a dial-up connection. Okay. Oh. You have to set your Outlook to actually go over a LAN and not over a dial-up. That's the issue. You actually have to change the options. While she's getting that running, what other problems? It sounds like you had more than one. And then when, it, when I exit out of it, it says that um, it's trying to send the messages that I've been trying to send. It right. says um, unable to pull for new messages on your HTTP server. Right. And uh, it has a... <clears throat> When they installed the cable modem, did a guy come out and actually set up the settings for that, or did they expect you to do that for yourself? No, he came out. He tried to set the email up, but it beat him, too. He, what? He obviously didn't know what he was doing. No. Who's your, who's your cable modem provider? AT&T. Okay, so it's at home. Pardon? It's at, it's at home. home. Yeah, it's, it's at home. Yeah. Okay. So at home, uh, it's kind of critical, and actually, to get this set up right. I know exactly what he did wrong, by the way. Okay. Because uh, I have at home. Am too. I right in the spot that he's wrong? You're right. No, nope. you show that. Go ahead and show that. Because okay. that is the issue of dialing out, and that we'll is that. you have to tell. You have. This is uh, Outlook Express, but it's pretty much the same in Outlook. You have Go to, to tell it. Accounts. Okay. Accounts. Hit mail. Your mail. Hit the properties now here under connection. Connect using my local area network. That's, LAN. That's set wrong. It's set down here using phone line. That's why it keeps trying to dial out. Okay. Right. See this. No, but we did set it at LAN. Okay, there's one okay. other place to look. Where's the other one? Here, I'll show you. Now you do this one. I'll show you. There's one more in the setup. It keeps saying that it's a VPN port adapter or something. Is that something to do with it? Yeah, that's going to be over here in your network, network neighborhood. neighborhood. You want to make sure that you don't have a VPN install in here, okay, unless you're using VPN. And obviously, that's what, it's, that's what for some reason, your, uh, your uh, TCP IP is bound to your VPN. You, you don't use VPN, do you? Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you don't. If you, you don't. don't know, you don't, because you don't. it would be something a corporation would set up on your system so you could dial into their network. It's very specific. Press remove. Go to the VPN entry. This was the network control panel. Press remove. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of setups I'm going to show you real quickly that you need to do. Okay. Uh, that's mm -hmm. kind of critical in uh, at home. Oh. And one is you need to specify the domain, okay? Okay. Now, the reason is when you go over to these mail servers, and I bet this is true if you go look at Outlook Express or Outlook and see how they've set up your email account, when you set up the mail server, I'm going to be willing to bet that all they did was type in mail. Oh, for heaven's sake. Yeah, they, they just typed mail in. Okay, and the reason right. they just typed mail, there's two ways around this. Okay. The reason they typed mail is because in the network settings, this domain becomes your default. And it's assumed if you don't type anything else in. So what you would need to type is, now I don't know what it is for your area. It's going to be something like grandrap.michigan.home.com. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the domain. You'll, you'll see if you look in the piece of paper they gave you. It's going to be the domain name. It needs okay. to be entered correctly here. You don't have to worry about the host name. That's irrelevant. They gave you one like CX39743. Ignore yeah. that. But this has to be entered in correctly, and I'll tell you why. Because when you just enter in mail here, it, it assumes oh. it adds the domain name. Now, okay. there's one other way to do this, is to type the fully qualified domain name in here. So it would be mail dot whatever that is, grandrap.michigan.home.com. Okay. Does that, is that making sense, Moses? Yes, it is. Okay. okay. So in other words, the guy who was setting it up probably was new. <laughs> He just right. didn't finish. Didn't know what he was doing. He had a okay? couple more steps. So make sure you can, first of all, you can delete that VPN. Your TCP IP property should be bound to your Ethernet card. Did they give you an Ethernet card or USB? Uh, Ethernet. Okay. And only to the Ethernet card. TCP right. IP should not be You can remove be bound. this. See, it's bound to the dial-up adapter. Remove that. 
Okay. And also <clears throat> make sure it's not bound Remove to the client that. for Microsoft Networks. Okay. Or to Microsoft that's Family a security logon. setting now we're talking about yeah, here. That doesn't have anything to do with operation, but that's, that's a very good security setting. So now notice, I've deleted everything, but I have my Ethernet adapter here, mm -hmm. and you can even delete this dial-up adapter if you don't use dial-up anymore. you don't need a modem okay. anymore. And so I'm going to delete that, too. Yep. I just have this and TCP IP. That's all you okay. need. Okay. And then the settings for TCP IP are in here when you double-click TCP IP. And if I you go to... Bindings. Gate, oh, uh, not right gateway. Well, bindings, bindings. Is, you could turn these off. You're right. Uh -huh. Turn off the Microsoft Family log on and turn off the client for Microsoft Networks. These are, that's a security... Uh, Say yes. Okay. That's, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just a, it tells you that the well, world is coming there. to an end. Well, let me out of there. I'm going to say one. And you need to have one. Okay. And then I'm going to go to uh, first. DNS okay. configure. All oh, right. That's right. I haven't yeah. installed NetBuoy. And that's only if you're going to file sharing. And then I'm going to, the main thing is make sure you have the fully qualified domain name in there okay. or fully qualified domain name in your email settings. Okay? Sure. See, I, we gave you a lot of stuff, didn't we? Yep. Good news, At Home has a website that tells you step by there step what to do. Okay. So, if can you get on the web? Yep. All right. All right. Go to At Home's website. You know, by the way, the way I figure this out, one last thing. I know we're getting long on time here, and I want to make sure we have enough time for Transmeta, but one last thing. When you go to the web, yep. you'll probably notice that when you go to your home page, he just types www, doesn't he? Right. And I, when he first did that, I said, what do you mean www? There's nothing at www. That's because the rest of the address is assumed from the domain name they entered in there. Ah. So that's how that works, is they have a fully qualified domain name in the, in, in, in the network control panel, and that's hmm. assumed on the rest of it. Okay, so your homepage is www. No, if I do it here, it's going to well, go to www.zdcom.com. I learned something new just now. Thanks, All right, Matt. Moses. Good luck. All right, good luck, Moses. Coming up next, Kate's going to go into chat. I am so excited. We've been talking about Transmeta, Linus Torvalds, company. What's he been working on? That secret thing It's called Caruso. The secret revealed right here when the screensavers continues. Okay. What's he talking about? What's he saying? ScreenSavers.com. It's the best place for more information about what's on this here show. Check out Show and Tell, where you'll find the complete story of our newest ultimate gaming machine. We call it Ugum Mach 2. Plus video clips from recent shows. You can watch TV on your computer at thescreensavers.com. Linus Torvalds was here, what, about a year ago and told us, yeah, I'm working on something called Transmeta. We said, what's that? He said, I can't tell you. Well, now it can be told. Transmeta made its big announcement. Uh, I guess it was yesterday, we broadcast it, streamed it on the web, probably the largest audience we've ever had for a streaming broadcast on the internet at ZDTV.com. Lots of interest in Caruso and, Caruso and the company Transmeta, and here to show us the chip and how it's going to be used, the CEO and founder of Transmeta, there's their website, David Ditzel is here. Dave, welcome to the Screensavers. Hey, Leo, glad to be here. Thanks for You're much. a CEO, but you're more than a CEO. You're a chip designer, aren't you? Well, Mark? I've been a chip designer for many years, back since the early days of RISC microprocessors processors in about 1980s, so I've been doing this for more than 20 years. In fact, you were at Cal and wrote the pay this kind of seminal paper that did Early the papers concept. on risk technology yeah. uh, involved in a lot of early risk chips, most recently Spark chips. I was the chief scientist for the Spark business at Sun until uh, we had kind of a great idea for a new chip, and uh, that's what we've been working on for the last five years in secrecy. Wait a minute, David. Why does the world need another chip? We've got plenty of chips. Don't we? Well, you might think so, but uh, you know a lot of the What's benefits wrong with of the Intel or the G4 and well, a lot of them uh, we're finding out weren't compatible with a lot of the stuff on the internet. Okay. And as the internet became really dominant, really the PC platform was made, what made it all happen. And when you go and you use your web browser and you want to get plugins, those are little X86 compatible programs. Right. And what we want to do is to bring the power of RISC technology and low power usage so we can really go mobile and put all that together in a compatible platform. And that's what's new and unique about Crusoe. So what you're saying about uh, Intel's Pentium 2 and Pentium 3, the x86 chips, is their closures. They don't, for a mobile solution, they're too big, use too much power, they run too well, hot. Well, they are a little hot. There's some great chips there, and they're great on the desktop and great in servers and maybe some high-end notebooks. But, you know, we're going to enable some new kinds of platforms the world has never seen before. There are two Crusoe chips. This is uh, on the one on...
on your right is the smaller of the two. That is an eight, what, 700, 800 megahertz? 700 megahertz ship and 0.18 micron technology. And then the uh, one on the left is 0.22. It's a 0.22. It's meant more for mobile internet devices. It's a 400 megahertz chip. Okay. And you're going to see that in some uh, mobile internet devices running the Linux operating system. The higher end chip we think will be more in more traditional notebooks running the Microsoft Windows operating system. So we got a chip for everything, although either chip can run either operating system. It's just more where they tend to fit in the market. Now, uh, these chips, uh, you don't make them. You, you don't have a fab, right? No, we do all the design work of the chips, all the technology. We contract out the manufacturing to the what we think is the best semiconductor fab on the planet at IBM. IBM makes these. They use copper. It's a copper chip. Uh, how important is that? We hear a lot about copper. Uh, currently, that's not what's used. It's an aluminum substrate, right? Uh, in many of the chips, they use aluminum. Copper yeah. helps a little bit. And uh, these are two of the first chips uh, outside of IBM by any company other than IBM. Does it make it faster, lower power? Uh, it makes the chips a little bit faster. That's yeah. one of the ways we get to 700 megahertz okay. that use the copper technology. Now, this is what's interesting about this chip. I've heard it pitched as an x86 chip, but it's not, is it? Well, it's really interesting because this piece of silicon it's not. It's what's called a very long instruction word processor. It uses, uses 128-bit wide instructions. And you say, well, it's got a new instruction set we've never seen before. How could it run any software? And the answer is the microprocessor that we built yeah. isn't just the chip. Right. It's also got a piece of software involved. Three quarters of the functionality of our microprocessor is actually in some very advanced software. We call it code morphing software. It'll take your x86 application and morph it as you run dynamically. It's an emulator. Well, no, it's not. It's some brand new technology. It's much How's faster it than emulation. Well. To start with, uh, uh, emulation technology tend to be written with very static programs. You write an emulator and that's right. it. This equals this, this equals this. Absolutely. Make the translation. What we do is we do this dynamically. We take your program, we figure out where you're executing, we run it, and in fact, it's the first smart microprocessor in it that can actually learn about your application while you're running and say, oh, you're spending a lot of time here. Let me go and optimize that code further. Mm -hmm. And instead of the, you know, typically four registers you get on an Intel chip, we've got 64 integer registers in this chip, so we can do a lot more optimization than was possible with a traditional uh, x86 style so you're architecture. you're saying that as the program runs, it runs faster and faster? The longer you run, the faster it gets, <laughs> That's cool. and the more power efficient it gets. Really? And so by you're doing less. Absolutely. Now, the learning mode happens really quickly, a few seconds where, up front. Where does this but, software lie? Where does this, where does this morphing software? Is it in the chip? Is it in RAM? Well, when the, when the machine is turned off, like your BIOS, yeah. it's in the BIOS ROM. So it's in firmware. It, it's actually, and then when it's turned on, it actually gets copied into DRAM and brought into the L2 and L1 caches just like any other program how because much, it is just like any other how program. How much cache on this chip? Well, there's 400 kilobytes of that's cache a lot. on this 700 megahertz that's chip. That's a lot. There's, you said well, 64 data, 64 instruction, well, 256 for uh, L2 cache. L2, 256 L2, and then there's 16 kilobytes just for the software to use itself for special things. But the amazing part of this chip is at 700 megahertz, it only dissipates about one watt of power. That is the secret, because you know, transistors burn a lot of power, but software doesn't. So right. every time we could move functionality into the software, we were able to deliver much lower power. Ah, oh, but you pay a price, because it's not in the microcode, it's slower because it's running in software. Oh, right? absolutely not, because in these programs get brought into the L2 and the L1 caches, they run at full speed, oh, and through our code morphing, we can actually translate the sequence of uh, x86 instructions into a much more efficient set. Now, on our website, there's some detailed examples of this. You go to the technology white paper, and it shows an example. We took 20 Intel instructions, and we turned that into 10 instructions for the Crusoe chip. That's cool. 10 instructions runs faster than 20. What can you say? All right, so what are we going to... By the way, Linus was involved in some of the coding of the code morphing software, The right? big secret we had is Linus was one of the key software developers in the code morphing software. We've got a team of about 30 really advanced programmers right. that are building the code morphing software, and he was one of the members of that team, one of the you know, I can very see premier you, members of the team. I can see how you get him out from Finland. I mean, that's a very intriguing, exciting project. He came over because he said this is one of the most exciting yeah. projects in computer science he had seen, and it lets us build some really fascinating new platforms. This is something that's gonna, that is actually going to be made. This is not well, a prototype? Uh, no, this was something that, that's being shown by some of the manufacturers in Taiwan that may be OEM, directly from some of the large tier one computer companies. And this is actually a working computer here. Uh, we actually have this, it's a, a web tablet. It's connected over a wireless link. 
Yeah. We're running Netscape here. And Are you can... running the 400 megahertz? Uh, oh, this is the 400 megahertz chip here. We can tap it, a, and a whole keyboard pops out. Compared to a Pentium 2 or Pentium 3. It's it's pretty similar for browsing the web. You couldn't tell you the difference. Tell the difference. I like the keypad. Yeah. I really like this for uh, GDTV. Camera. Up at the top here, there's a USB camera. That means I could uh, I could do a little net call. You could call. do your show on the road. I love this. That's great. Okay. Uh, how much do they have any idea how much this is going to cost? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. And the question is, will they actually sell it for a particular price, for example, $1,000 to $2,000 right. somewhere? Or I think it's just as likely you'll probably get this with your Internet service for $19.95 a month. In, in other words, you won't pay for it at all. It'll just be part of the I think service. it'll be part of the overall Compact service. flash on the back. I like there's that. There's a compact flash. You put up to 256 megabytes of compact flash. And there's also one slot for PCMCA. And that's oh, usually that's used for your radio link. Okay. Now, real quickly, because we're almost out of time, I do want to show this. This is not a real-world product. Okay. This is a prototype. This is what's coming next. And Transmeta is a technology developer of platforms. You can see here you have a little camera. Yeah. You could take it. You could write on this for handwriting recognition. In fact, this tablet actually does handwriting recognition. Hey, you want to go play a game? Game. Hey, plug in your gaming uh, options here. I love and go this. Off, and you can really have I love that. And playing games. That's so amazing. This is a, a concept developed by IDEO, the same company that developed the clever packaging for some of the more but recent the, the Palm Pilot devices. The key on this is you've got a chip that's small and low power, so battery use is good, and it's cool, so you don't need to have a lot of cooling. Absolutely. And yeah. so we're going to enable a new generation of lightweight computers, both traditional notebooks. What people are saying is what they care about most is it's too heavy, right. I hate carrying around, and I I want the battery to last a lot longer, and that's what Crusoe delivered. Last question. This is currently doing an x86, but it sounds like you could do anything. Well, we, in fact, demonstrated yesterday at our announcement uh, not only x86, but running Java bytecodes at the same time. And theoretically, if they do an IA64 platform, you could do IA64? Theoretically, a lot of things are possible, Leo. Today, really, Crusoe is primarily an need. x86 platform right. because that really is the dominant thing in the industry. And kids, this isn't Windows. That's Linux running on there with X Window. I love it. David, I really appreciate you coming by. It's kind of on short notice. I know today is a big day for you. You made your announcement uh, yesterday. We had a heck of an announcement, and uh, we're, we're uh, really glad we can stop all the secrecy and start to tell people what's yeah. going on. Oh, my. David Nissel right. is the CEO and uh, chip architect with Transmeta, creators of the new Crusoe microprocessor. Now, David is heading off right now into the chat room. He's going to be in there. If you want to chat with him and ask him questions about Crusoe and about Transmeta, chat.zdnet.com. And, of course, you can visit our site at zdtv.com to watch the announcement. It's stored there, or go to transmeta.com for more information on those white papers he talked about. Thank you, David. I really Thanks very much, Leo. That's, that's exciting. I can't wait to see some of these products. Now, folks, don't touch that dial. We're not done yet. Still to come on this very television program. Something I've been waiting for a long time. Offline storage solutions for archiving important documents. Also, more answers to your toughest computing questions. And set-top boxes that may change the way you watch TV. All that and more as the screensavers roll on, my friend. I am Leo Laporte. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah, you are Leo yeah, I am. Yeah. Today in the chat room, we're asking, should education be for sale? That me says, here you go. Here's $90,000. Here's a bunch of computer equipment for your school and Internet access. Okay, so there's some ads in the lower left-hand corner that you have to make sure all the kids can see. Oh, and we're not telling you this. We're actually collecting demographic information on your 13-year-old. According to the Consumer younger. Watchdog Group, and this is reported in the Wall Street Journal, uh, this watchdog group, a couple of watchdog groups, Phyllis Shapley's a member, Ralph Not Nader's either. a member, and they say that Zatme has been illicitly, behind, by, it, it is illegal to do this, by the, behind the scenes collecting demographic information about the kids. Is that worth it? to get computers in the school. Maybe it is. Maybe it's, maybe well, computers are hugely essential and it's sick that we don't have enough money to just buy them anyway. That's, That's what, makes what really me makes me mad. Yeah, we got to value education in this country. We got to value teachers, we got to value the schools and we got to pay what it takes to make sure our kids get educated cuz frankly <laughs> that's the future. That's all there Can is. You tell me quickly as a dad, is it worth it to you for your kids if they wouldn't otherwise oh, have computers not. in school? Well, first of all, I don't think that that, I don't think my kids are an exception cuz obviously they're going to have a computer education. 
Yeah. I, what I do and what I've done for my schools, I've donated computers. I help them with a computer lab. I help them set it up. I help them make sure it works without having to go to outside people who are going to put advertising on the computers. Oh. We do it ourselves through the PTA, through bake sales, through raising money. And that's what it takes. It takes parent involvement, community involvement, and it takes, frankly, legislators that are willing to fund schools appropriately. Mm -hmm. okay. Anyway. Well, you can see what we think. We want to know what you think. Take the web poll, screensavers.com, and if clicking yes or no isn't enough and you want to say, this makes me sick, <laughs> this makes me want to take a bath, which it does, click on talk back and let us know. You know what I did this morning? What? I went into my uh, daughter's class. Did you take a bath? No, oh, no, I did do that. Oh, good. Thank I do that every week. We're very Whether grateful. Whether I need, need it, it or not. not. Yeah, we're grateful. <laughs> but, uh, no, I went in my daughter's second grade classroom and taught them all how to play chess. You did not. Yeah, it was really fun. Really? Yeah. If you, by the way, do it. If you ever want to have a great time, go in a classroom and teach them something you know. You te yeah. teach them dance. It is so satisfying. I did that. With Chat with us. Person. Yeah, it's great. Chat with us at chat.zdnet.com. And, of course, Dave Dissel of uh, Transmeta is in there. If you have questions about him, about uh, the Crusoe product, he is in the bookshelf. Right, David? Absolutely. Oh, okay, he's in the bookshelf. All I know so far is that Evil Charles wants to know what color socks Mr. Ditzel's wearing. So, <laughs> We're not going to him. tell. We're not going to tell. Kenny is now joining us on the ZDTV3 Comnet Cam Network from noon in Georgia. Hi, Kenny. Hey, Kate and Leo. How, How you, you doing? doing? We're good. That's great. You look good, man. Nice <laughs> picture. Are you at work, Kenny? No, no, I'm at home. I'm at home. He just dresses nicely with every hair in place. For, you look oh, you great. cleaned up for us. And, you, and it looks like I thought maybe you worked for like UPS or something. You had a map of the U.S. with little push pins in it. Yeah, I love that map. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I love it. What are the push pins marking, Kenny? Yeah, what are they marking? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Delta map. Uh, so they're mapping uh, out where the uh, airlines? marches and arrivals and all that stuff. Oh, Delta Airlines. That's cool. Uh -huh. do, you, yeah. do you fly for the airlines or you want to? Uh, well, my dad works there, so oh, I... that's cool. You know. So now you know how to keep track of it. We flew Delta when we went to Atlanta. Good yeah. airline. I like Delta, yeah. Well, yeah, okay. Great. So well, what can we do for you? My question is, is I was wondering if I could use DRAM alongside RAM bus RAM. No. Oh, that's... Yeah, it's totally... It's electrically different. It's it looks the same, but it's not. They both look like DIMMs, although actually Rambus has a big metal plate, of course, on the front. But they're not electrically the same. It's also got, I believe, as I remember, a different notch. So yeah. you physically won't be able to. you have a Rambus motherboard? Uh, no, I don't, but the next computer I was planning on getting is going to have one. Oh, and you want to know if you could take your old oh, RAM, RAM with you. Mm-hmm, yeah. exactly. Unfortunately, this is kind of a rip, I think. Um, but well, okay. Let me, okay. Unfortunately, most of the time you cannot take your old RAM with you. Uh, and if you get a RAM bus motherboard, it will have RAM bus slots that are different physically and electrically, so you can't even fit the the old RAM It'll in. It'll be like eight hundred bucks. For but I want to say something. Okay. I don't think you need RAM bus. I don't either. I think you probably your next motherboard. You should look at PC one thirty three. There you go. I think RAM bus is way overpriced. I think PC-133 is fast enough. And if you have you have PC-100 RAM right now, SD RAM? Yeah. Yeah. You may even be able to put that in a 133 and get it to run. You know, it just depends on how good the 100. RAM is. Well, no, it would run a 133 if it could. If it could. If it can, it will. And sometimes SD RAM can and sometimes it can't, but it's worth a try. Yeah, and then I'd get to keep the old RAM, too. So. Well, that's the point. That's and exactly right. And RAM like 800 bucks for 128 yeah, I don't, meg. Yeah, I don't think it's yeah. worth it. It's outrageously priced. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's not worth it. it it's not meant for consumers. I I don't think either. I, I don't think you need the bandwidth. I really don't. No. Even PC100 is probably fast enough. What I did is I got a BP6 motherboard that has PC100 up to PC133. Okay. I've got SD100 RAM in it, and if I decide to upgrade, I'll try. I'll see if I can get that 100 to overclock in effect up to 133. If I can, I'll get a new stick. But that way, at least I have a chance. Very cool. Right? Yeah. Kate and Leo, can I get an autograph? Certainly. Oh, of course. Hang okay, on the line. We're great. gonna get your address so that we can come to your house and muss your hair up. Right. Sounds good. Okay, okay Kenny. Kenny. See you later. Okay. Thanks a lot. Oh, also, will you do us a favor? Sure. And uh, take us to break. Okay. Dump us out. Thanks, Kate and Leo. Uh, Newfangled PC-based appliances from the Consumer Electronics Show when the screensavers continues. Oh, that was just excellent, Kenny. Way well, now. Thanks a lot, Kate. All right, you rock. You rock. No, you do it. Screensavers Online Super Geek Challenge to test your tech knowledge in this week's quiz all about acronyms. FYI, to the screensavers.com. What does acronyms stand for? And congratulations to Elizabeth. A bunch of letters that spell out to make a word that means a phrase and stuff. Right? Not what does it mean? What does it stand for? ACR? <laughs> congratulations. We should come up with an acronym. Acronym. Okay. Congratulations to Elizabeth from Randolph, Massachusetts. Winner of yesterday's Super Geek Quiz or T-shirt or maybe a cap. 
That's it. That really. Not that. <laughs> wow. Of course, you know, you can't do that unless you fill out the form. Must be a blowing rock. For your chance to. <laughs> okay, now, here's Jim Louderback. With a look at converging technologies and set-top boxes from the consumer. Tested? Yeah, it is now. <laughs> Electronic show on today's A Fresh Year. What? You may not know it, but your television has become a new battleground. Set-top boxes, devices that marry a computer with your television, were fighting it out all over the convention floor. Companies were converging features and services inside their products to create new and more powerful boxes. Meet AOL TV. DirecTV's parent company, Hughes, and AOL rolled out their new set-top box, which integrates AOL's powerful online service with DirecTV's satellite receiver. Although it doesn't have broadband access, we do expect the Time Warner merger to change all that pretty soon. Expect AOL TV to support cable modems in the very near future. AOL TV is certainly going to give Microsoft's Web TV a run for its money, but Microsoft, too, has teamed up with a satellite service. The Dish Network was hyping the next version of their Dish Player. It's a satellite receiver and Web TV hybrid. It also includes digital video recording capabilities. Now, many of the problems we found in our tests of the first version have been fixed, but the alliances don't stop there. DirecTV and TiVo have partnered together to build this box, which combines their two services. Now, this is actually a pretty good idea, because as the television comes down from the satellite to your DirecTV box, you don't have to then uncompress it and then recompress it for the hard drive recorder. Putting them together saves that step, it improves television quality, and it should actually reduce the price of the components, because a lot of the circuitry is the same. Philips will make the box, but we don't know how much it's going to cost yet. The new box will store up to 30 hours of recorded programming, and it'll be available this summer. So if you're a DirecTV customer and you want to pick up TiVo or Replay, I'd say wait, because this box has got everything you need all in one. Sony has also entered the digital video recorder market. The company introduced its first TiVo box, the Sony SVR2000 Digital Network Recorder. This 30-hour set box ships next month at the stunning price of only $400. Now, that's $100 less than the 14-hour version that Philips sells today. The SVR2000 will integrate with Sony VCRs and TVs. That'll make it easy to dub your digital recordings onto tape. The Dish Network, in addition to partnering with Web TV, is also adding extra features to their satellite receiver boxes. One supports HDTV, and the other includes a DVD player. Now, this one right here, it's kind of nice to have all in one box. It's a little bit less expensive than buying the components separately, but I don't see a big connection between DVD and satellite reception, so you kind of limit yourself because you can't upgrade one without upgrading the other. Of course, it's only a matter of time before all these features find their way into an all in one box. And that'll turn the TV into an all in one portal for digital data, two way entertainment, and new and improved viewing. You can catch a new fresh gear with Patrick, Jim, and Sumi every fresh uh, Friday afternoon at 1.30, 12.30 Central right here on ZDTV. Because you know how much we love Patrick, Jim, and Sumi. Here's an email from Akito. Hot. He says, I have a lot of old papers, photos, and junk mail that I want to keep. How can I put all the information on the CD that resembles the encyclopedia with search features? Putting paper to CD when the screensavers continue. Email from Akito. He asks, I have a lot of old papers, photos, and junk mail that I want to keep, uh, but I want to put all the information on a CD that's like an encyclopedia I can search through. That's a really this good idea. Great. Wouldn't you love to do that? I would not. Take I? everything out of your attic? Actually, the, the, this is something that business has done for a long time. It's called workflow management. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole idea, you know, remember the paperless office? This was the whole idea of the that paperless office. That never happened so that everyone just printed right. out copies of all the electronic things? <laughs> but the idea was, let's imagine, I'm taking an order and I'm order taker, I take an order on a phone. Instead of filling out a piece of paper, I enter it into the computer and, the, and from then on, or maybe I put it on a piece of paper but it gets scanned in and from then on it's kind of an electronic workflow right out to the very end right. with no paper involved. A good example of this was, and I don't know if you noticed this, during the OJ trial, lots of documents, lots of evidence, right? Mm -hmm. The lawyers had a custom software solution written that would allow them to put a barcode on all the pieces of evidence. They had a laptop computer with all the documents associated with it. They'd scan the barcode on the evidence. The laptop computer would pull up all the data. Everything was stored digitally. 
great. Totally possible, totally doable. There have been big time solutions for this in business for years. There are plenty of solutions on the desktop that work just fine. Here's one we like. This is from a company called DocuMagics. It's called Paper Master. And look at it, it's a filing cabinet. Now, by the way, this is currently on uh, a hard drive, but you see we can easily publish the cabinet and we can even publish it to a CD. Mm -hmm. In fact, you can even create an autoplay enabled CD Isn't that great? using the cabinet viewer software here. So it's exactly what our viewer is asking for. Plus it has, if you're using a scanner with OCR or if this has... It does. So what it's going to do, say you have a stack of bills or your taxes, you put them in the scanner. You need a document and feeder in. and this is, this is a document feed scanner. I don't think we have it working right now, but you put the documents, the bills or whatever in here. Staples in. Well, yeah. Uh, really make sure it doesn't work. Put them in there. Scan it would it scan through. it all through. It goes in here. It OCRs it. Now that's important because you want to index all the words, right? So yes. you have a, key, a keyword search will work. You don't have to type in keywords. Character recognition. And, How cool is that? And you can see we can store everything in here, not just you can create as many folders as you want like this, and you can scan these in. They'll go in these folders. If you open it, you'll open a document that's in there. Faxes, projects, but look, even websites, web pages. And it'll give you thumbnails of all of the documents exactly. that you have. So this is a really great way. Now, I am personally not organized enough and probably don't really have the need to do this. But the, the paper is my enemy. I have piles and piles and piles of paper in my house. I'd love to get rid of them. And if you feel kind of the, the kind of nervous about throwing out stuff that you might need for documentation for the IRS or somewhere down the road, this is a great solution. Put it in here. Archive the originals way back in the attic for later. Inexpensive software. It's called Paper Master. It comes from a company called DocuMagic. You can use it with any scanner. We recommend if you're going to go out and buy a scanner, you get one like this HP ScanJet with a document feeder because that's going to make it much easier to load in a whole bunch of stuff. And this, as I said, has this automatic button to publish it to CD, including putting the cabinet viewer software in an autoplay CD. You don't even have to own the software to be able to play that CD back. So it's exactly what you want. There's your archives. Okay. Enjoy. All right. That is so cool. Isn't I'm really neat? thinking about doing this myself. I give you the software here. It's, it's you give it to I me? I give it to you. Take what? it away. Enjoy it. Actually, you can download a demo of this software from the DocuMagic site, so you don't even have to, oh. you don't even need to say. Thanks anyway. You're welcome. Man, I like it. I give it to you. Thanks, God. <laughs> you know, it's not easy putting on a show. You're easy. Yeah, it. No, I mean, giving you the stuff, you're easy. Thank I you for clarifying oh, that. Man, I, that was not right. Easy to I didn't please. Need, easy, easy to please. please. Thank you. Right. Except for the fact that we're putting on the show day in, day out. We're alone. Hello. Where are you? Where are your females? Where Record are your them. females? We want That's your females. The emails. The screensavers.com for quiet out loud. Just click on the air out email. Why can't you all be like Linda from Amarillo? Why? She did it. Look. Look at Linda. Look. Tell how I start. Come on, Linda. Hi, I'm Linda West from Amarillo, Texas. Uh-uh-uh, don't touch that dial. Screensavers will be right back. Oh, she's cute. Howdy, welcome back to Screensavers. Take a peek up there on your screen there and see the preliminary results of today's poll so far. Whoa. Wow, 85% of you, heck no, my education should not be for sale. You've got 24 hours. To vote on that at thestreamsavers.com. It's, it's not like that was a slanted question or anything. Or anything. <laughs> should, should all of your lives, your, should your children be for sale? This is uh, the time we, uh, journalism, journalism. we we try to slow down and answer some email here. Oh, we're going to slow down? No. James from <laughs> Castle Rock, Colorado, I was just pretending, uh, wrote, uh, I, I, uh, negative uh, scanners. Photo negative scanners. We showed the negative scanners. And he said, you know, they're kind of expensive. Uh, Places like uh, Kinko's, Wolf's Camera, that will do the negative scanning for you, are there? Yeah, many service bureaus will do and put them on CD. Kodak will send you a, a negative yeah. CD. So it's not, it's not a hard thing to do. Uh, and certainly that's not a, not a bad way to go either. Okay. But the whole the question was, how can I avoid going into the Photoshop? And that oh. seems like it would be no different, right? Right. So that's the point, oh. I guess. Well, okay, there you okay. go. Um, Squires. A.K.A. Squires. Blue Rat wrote to us. Blue, Blue Rat says, one of your past shows you gave a website to see if your computer was hacker-proof. How can I find this set again? Oh, yes. Not necessarily hacker-proof. Now, Steve Gibson from GRC.com does not promise you that running Shields Up is going to guarantee that you're hacker-proof because it'll show you, he said, some things I can it's do today, informational I'm going to be able to do tomorrow. It informational check, purposes. Check your security. GRC.com run Shields Up. Yeah, I like that a lot. Uh, Double Shoe, 
Double O shoe. Double O shoe. Says I saw an ATI Rage Fury Max, 64 megs of VRAM. Want to know if it's better than the Creative Labs 3D Annihilator? Not Ooh. in our test. -uh. We don't like the Max all that much. They've basically taken two 128s and put them on a card. That's why it's got that much memory. Uh, we don't think there's anything that beats the G-Force, particularly the G-Force DDR. That's oh. the Annihilator Pro. Oh, That's what we've got about them. We love it. Hey, thanks so much to David Ditzel, CEO and founder of Transmeta, for coming in. We wish you luck with Crusoe. We can't wait to get some Crusoe products in here. That's very exciting. And uh, we thank you for chatting. Thank you for joining us. That's it for this edition of the Screensavers. I am Leo Laporte. I am Kate Patel. We'll see you next time on Screensavers. Bye-bye. No, bye-bye.